The views and opinions expressed in listening are those of the host of the program and its guests. They do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of WGTE Public Media. The young of today face issues their parents and grandparents did not. Mass shootings, unprecedented political division, global warming, urban violence which takes its toll disproportionately among the young, cyberbullying, and the highest rate in teen suicide in years. Teen suicide is the second leading cause of death in young people ages 10 to 14 and the third leading cause of death in ages 15 to 24. Some 20% of high school students polled say they have had thoughts of suicide and 9% say they have attempted it. There should not be that much despair among those so young. I met with six students from Washington local schools in Toledo who themselves experienced the trauma of an active shooter at a high school football game. Um, So on October 7th, 2022, our school faced a very big security threat and um, one of our students was shot. Um, I was part of the band and all you heard, we thought it was fireworks because it was a big game. We played Central Catholic. Um, Everyone was excited for the game. Like we had a pet band. game and it was it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a Friday night football game and for so many of our band members, our cheerleaders, our students, our community, it was a safe place and then um, the shooting happened and all I could hear was my band director saying, just run. Drop your instruments, your music, run. Um, the Monday after school, after that shooting and on social media was horrendous. So in my personal experience, I was standing on the front um, in the stands, I was against the fence. And all I could hear was just like, it sounded like a stampede running. So when I turned and looked, everyone was just running on the stands. I couldn't hear anything. I didn't hear the gunshots go off, but I was pushed directly onto the ground because of everyone running and trampling on the stands. And I had a friend who was started to run and turned around and saw me on the ground and he pulled me up. And then we jumped directly down off the stands and just ran across the field just running. I didn't know what to do, who to help. My friends were on the ground. I couldn't help. I just knew I had to get out. And running was like, it's just so crazy because you're looking around. You don't know what to do. You don't know where you're going because you don't know where it came from. You don't know the safe space to go to. What did the rest of you think? Um, Well, from my experience of that night, I was just sitting there with my friends watching the game, and I kind of zoned out for a second. And I like got pushed over because like a whole lot of people were just running, and I heard the pops, but I didn't think anything of it. Mm-hmm. And one of my friends told me they're like somebody's shooting, so I started running with the crowd, and they were all kind of like crammed at the left side of the student section, and I my first instant was to just get somewhere safe. I know most people spent their night that night calling everyone and... Everyone they knew. Yeah, mm-hmm. and he is 13, probably 12 at the time, or... Yeah, um, I was 12. He did, had... It's just wrong for him to feel that way. He was terrified and sad. He's so young. I think with the increase of urban violence and gun violence that we've seen, especially in our communities, we are concerned because the statistics are not lying. You know, we went through a school shooting, and that's not something that I thought I ever would be able to say. Right. But now the fact that I am able to say it is scary, yeah. and it shouldn't become the normal. Do you all feel personally anxious or sort of anxious for the society? Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's more we're anxious for everyone in a whole, especially we see it happening, getting children getting hurt, which is sad as it is. So, so. I mean, although it shouldn't happen to any of us, I mean, 
our younger kids, like, they shouldn't have to go through that at all. Like, that's, it's a lot to deal with, especially at a young age like this, and it's a lot to deal with for anyone. But, like, how sad is it that we are teaching five-year-olds to cover their desks and how to hide and how to, you know, do a lockdown drill? You know, I babysit quite frequently, and these five-year-olds are learning this in preschool. What has our society come to that this is needed? Yeah. And it's sad and it's frightening, and I feel for the five-year-olds because they do not need to know this. We do not need to know this. I mean, you guys should not be dealing with this, so my generation and the one after failed. I want to ask you about a second issue that you guys face. There's all this research now on depression and self-harming among younger people. What do you think about that? Why, why is that problem there? And what's your feeling about how to deal with it? I think it was still as prevalent as an issue as it was 25 years ago. Just it was very stigmatized and it was taboo. Um, same with a lot of other topics. And I think that our society for so long has pushed down mental health. What do the rest of you think? Um, I feel like like the bullying, the cyberbullying online, it needs to stop. Yeah. Because that's a big part yeah. of like why students are like depressed and I feel like it just needs to end. Yeah. How did it get so out of hand? I think a lot of it stems from family life. Like you don't feel good at home. Like I know in elementary school they say if someone's bullying you it's probably because they have stuff going on at home and I think that is a big thing because and I think we should stop it there. We should help those kids who are having trouble at home and then they could become friends with others and just, yeah. Say, I, I got bullied in elementary school, but I would say, so it's like, you know, a really sensitive topic for me, sorry. So you got bullied, but you, you felt you had enough of a support system to withstand it. Yeah. Yeah. And some people don't. I think a lot of it has to do with like not having like a home. And your home doesn't have to be like where you sleep or like where your family is, but it's like the people around you and actually care for you. Like some people just don't have like the same I wanted to get some perspective on the issues the students raised from a professional. I arranged to meet with psychiatrist Dr. Rajiv Parinja of Mercy Health to find out about mental health triggers and stressors that youth today face. So doctor, I thought we might start with, um, how is it different to be a teen in America today in terms of mental health and health in general um, versus 25, 30 years ago? Yes, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a very interesting question and we know that um, it is different to be a teen today and one of the things that we are very concerned about is that teen well-being is much worse today than it was and we have so many data points which tell us that things are not going so well for the teens in America today as they were um, you know, over a decade ago. Um, for example, uh, the number of people turning up to an ER with a suicide attempt who are under 18, uh, that has um, gone up substantially. It has tripled in a period a little over 10 years. Is there a distinction between the de sort of depression quasi-epidemic -epi um, and addiction problems? Are they sort of separate issues? Do they overlap? Uh, they, they do overlap. Um, people who have depression, they're not feeling too great. They are looking for something to help them get out of that state of distress, depression, and you know the lack of enjoyment of life, and they may begin to experiment with drugs. Uh, sometimes people begin to experiment with drugs uh, under the influence of their peers or for other reasons, and that we know worsens depression and makes you more vulnerable to mental health problems. And one of my concerns is that there seems to be a misconception uh, generally, um, and probably more so among younger people, that if you can fix how you're feeling by taking a recreational drug, 
that is okay and that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that if you feel better, then that must be right because you have treated the problem. So marijuana, for example, is not so benign as it may be perceived by especially the younger population. That is correct. Um, you know, it um, never uh, sort of fails to surprise me when I'm interviewing people and I'm, if I'm asking this question of somebody who is over 60 and, you know, do you ever use recreational drugs? And most people would say no. And they would say no, uh, you know, or almost with a surprise that you're asking me this question. Uh, but when I'm asking this question of younger people, you know, people who are under 25, more than half the time they would be using it. Um, and they would um, very often think that that is perfectly normal. But for conditions like depression and anxiety, marijuana can definitely give you symptom relief when you start using it. Uh, but uh, it worsens mental health down the road uh, because of the way in which it acts. Mm -hmm. And you know, I try a lot of analogies with my patients to kind of explain to them why that is the case. Um, and sometimes they recognize this and say, you know, I, I, I know what you're saying. But an example would be, you know, if um, you were training for a race and your legs are sore and a friend comes by and says, you know, you don't need to run anymore, just get in the car, I'll take you to the end of the uh, line. And you say, oh my God, this feels so much better, thank you. Now you know that when you do that, you are not training anymore, right. but you feel better. Yeah. And if you make it a habit of saying, well, next time I'm just going to drive the, drive the course in a car, um, and you um, keep doing that, you will um, gradually become less fit, not more. Do you, how do you feel about this whole kind of million dollar question of, I mean, at the end of the day, why? Why would so many teens be depressed? Is it the state of the world? Is it social media? I know it's not any one thing. It isn't. You know, when we have something this complex, there are uh, many reasons. Uh, it's hard to know um, which one of them is um, playing the biggest role. But I think in my mind, uh, the biggest suspect here is uh, technology. And social media is one big piece of it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about it, we live in a time where it is easier to keep yourself entertained while sitting down than ever before. The increased use of technology harms mental health in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, we are moving less. And um, you know, I think we're designed to move uh, at a certain level, which is important for both our physical and mental health. The social media piece is important because that is changing the information that kids receive about their peers. Mm -hmm. But now, it appears on social media when people put out information only about the most positive aspects of their lives, that everybody's life is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I, my life, when I know all about it, just seems to be, well, you know, um, it's not going so well. So you think even if a person's not being bullied or harassed, by social media, social media in itself is sort of alienating and, and technology itself is alienating. I think it is. I think the cyberbullying piece is an important component, but I don't think that everybody whose mental health is worse uh, is being bullied. I think it is just the way information is coming at us um, and the way we are interpreting it which makes us feel that um, everybody's life is better. And you know, we want to have this sense that we are kind of doing okay. We get our sense of self-worth and we get validation from the society around us. And when everybody else seems to be doing better, that, is, um, that makes us feel that something is wrong with us. And that can be depressing. It can be anxiety provoking. So if you could wave a magic wand, what, what do we do about all this? So I think, you know, um, we are designed to be in good health when we do certain things. And if you think about physical health, we have some understanding of that. Mm -hmm. So that recognition that I love sugar and I love fat, but I can't be eating that all the time mm -hmm. uh, because that's not how I'm designed. Uh, if I do that, it's worse for my health. I think if we had the same recognition for mental health, mm -hmm. we could change how we interact with our peers, how we um, you know, relate to the world around us in a way that our mental health is better. Mm -hmm. So for young people, I would say, you know, uh, 
social media has become such an integral part of how they interact with each other that you cannot let go of it. But where there's a possibility, spend more time meeting people face to face. Mm. You know, do things together which require you to be physically active. Uh, play sport, uh, you know, go, go for a run, um, and uh, do activities together that require you to be moving. That would help. Um, and also recognize that, you know, nobody really puts out information on social media which tells you the whole picture. We are always, always trying to give a good impression of ourselves. And when you are only getting information on social media, that isn't the complete picture. And when you know that, you maybe feel less um, distressed about it. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us. You're welcome. Fascinating. So, how to help young people find purpose. I met with civil rights and labor leader Baldemar Velasquez about a program his Farm Labor Organizing Committee has organized for city youth. He calls it the Flock Homies Union. The emphasis is on self-worth and empowerment. So, Baldemar, you're a, a labor leader, a civil rights leader in the nation, even in the world. But you also live in Toledo. So how did you come to start the Homies and what was the idea behind them? Well, the program essentially fell in our lap. Uh, but um, an organizer is always looking for an opportunity to bring people together, particularly those people that are on the margins of life. And um, we've always had a core of people here in the, the heart of the uh, the Latino community in Toledo, the South, uh, this, what they call the Old South End. The roots of many families are here. Uh, now they're spread all over the city, the kids, the grandkids. Uh, but the, it was all started here. And so we've always had a pocket of followers here. Many of them are former migrant workers that worked in the fields. And so uh, a, a mom came to us that can can uh, our, my kids hang on in your office for a couple hours after school because I don't want them wandering in the streets after school. That's how it started. That's how it started. So huh. we, they invited some of their friends and, uh, and pretty soon those friends invited other friends and pretty soon we had a dozen of them, then 15, then 20, all hanging out there. And I told the volunteer, why don't we do something with them? Uh, why don't we start having some discussions on conflict resolution, uh -huh. uh, how to negotiate win-win situations, uh, principles of nonviolence, uh -huh. uh, because we knew the gang issues, the gang problems, and so on. So the homies have spurred a lot of uh, grassroots activity, so now we're working, interacting with adults and uh, trying to take on some of the more troubling issues So you're in the teaching city. young people who are not from a privileged background, but sometimes the uh, a tough background. You're teaching them how to organize, how to change the community. Well, the, the, yeah, the good thing about the, uh, this program with uh, Jobs and Family Services is that um, it's not only employment readiness, it's uh, engaging young people and giving them a, a purpose. Yeah. And when they start addressing some concrete things, uh, they find a purpose in their life and it helps them uh, make different choices in life. So instead of making wrong choices, we don't tell them not, we don't tell them, you know, don't join gangs, don't do this, don't do that. We just engage them and uh, uh, give them some constructive things to ventilate their, maybe their anger, their, their uh, whatever. And, and hopefully they make better choices. And we've seen some success in that with the kids. So you don't teach, you empower. Well, it's like... I mean, you don't preach. No, we don't, no. Uh -uh. We just say, you know, what bothers you when you get out of bed in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> I challenge them back. It's, well, I don't like this, I don't like, well, do something about it. And it's not, nah, it's, it's, it's no use, you know. Well, it, well, I said, well, then you must like it. I said, what do you mean? I don't like it. Well, you like it because you put up with it. So <laughs> we challenge them back. And get, <laughs> if you want to do something, you come to, you know, I'll help you. Because when you talk about violence and shootings and uh, gang, things like that, well, that's going to come out of these very impoverished neighborhoods. And you got to reach those folks, you know, uh, engage them and, and uh, 
you know, get them to share what's on their heart and what's on their mind, especially the kids. And um, uh, because you get the kids and then you, you reach the parents through the kids. So we have a, a two-pronged effort with the program. Not only the kids, but we try to reach the, uh, the families. So you, you can't help the kids unless you help the family. So. I wanted to know more about how the program works. So I spoke with a graduate, Isaiah Brink. So, Isaiah, um, you're a graduate of the Homies program. What did, what did the Homie Union do for you? What did it, how did it change your life? I'll start off by saying that the Homies showed me um, you have to be with a group of people. You can get so much done alone, but you're better together. It's two or three is stronger than just if you're alone. So yeah. that's one big thing the Homies showed me. Does a program like that address what's going on with young people in a city, any city? Is it a correction for, is it an answer for poverty, crime, whatever, loneliness, isolation? Does it help with that or is it more like a practical skills thing? I would say it's both. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say it's an answer, but if you apply yourself to the program, you'll get directions to your answer. They're not gonna solve your life's biggest problems, but you'll definitely get a sense of belonging and direction and purpose, really. If you were um, talking to a younger person, trying to tell them, hey, give this a try, what, what would be your pitch? You can have a hand in your community actively, not just passively or talking about it, but this is a chance to do something get paid while doing it and meet new people that you can have some solid friendships that long after the program too. What's your kind of personal take on uh, you know, gun violence, gang violence? Why is this stuff happening? Why does it seem to be ticking up in Toledo right now? What do we do about it? What I feel about it is people don't feel like they have an alternative to it. Some people are quote unquote born into it, some people, this is all they see, you know? They get on TV, they play video games, it's a lot of gun games, a lot of gun music, violent music, so it's kind of second nature to a lot of people. Yeah. And um, what we can do about it is have, get the word out about the homies and other programs like it to have something to do. I mean, they're taking down a lot of basketball courts and different parks and if we're being honest, people don't really go to parks and play anymore. It's, if they're not outside, they're inside scrolling on the phone. So to be in a community like the Homies program where it's together, I think will help out a lot. Well, thank you very much. I think you, I think you've got a lot going. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Got a bright future. Thank you. Thank you. I must grant the last word to the Washington local students. In our conversations, they left me with much to think about. They are fiercely loyal and bound to each other, their teachers, and their school. Our society for so long has pushed down mental health. And now our generation especially has done nothing but raise it up and lift it up. And I'm so excited to see what our generation does. Um, I think that sometimes when you are in like a really dark place, you don't always realize that all you might need to do is just reach out to someone or text a friend to say, hey, like I need help. And so it just builds on and on because you want to do it by yourself and you don't think that anything else is going to help. But sometimes all you really need to do is just Tell somebody like, hey, I need help, I'm not doing okay. You know, even if you aren't ready to reach out for help, there's little things like simply fixing your posture, wanting to go do things, sitting outside, really realizing the beautiful things around you, just looking outside can simply bring a smile to your face. And I think that that's one of the biggest issues is people find a lot of comfort and sadness because they can't find the comfort anywhere else. Mm. Wow. Tell me what um, gives you hope, gives you inspires you or what maybe what person us. inspires you we inspire each other a lot us sitting at this table right now mm. is giving us every single little amount of hope that we can possibly have i agree i think our generation is not afraid anymore you know we've sat through 
what no person should ever have to. And the fact that even this table, you know, we're all very diverse. To see like our group in these meetings with adults and how not only are we respected, but we respect them back. And I'm really hopeful for our generation. Every generation feels that it is unique and different. And to a large degree, this is true. This new generation is inheriting things we should not be leaving them with. They will deal with it, all of it, with determination, compassion, and reason, which are always our tools. They too will come through. You can see it in their faces, the faces of my young Washington local friends, and hear it in the voice of a young person like Isaiah. They inspire, they have found, and they are creating hope. The views and opinions expressed in listening are those of the host of the program and its guests. They do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of WGTE Public Media. This program was made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.